Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. Yes, Dr. Thomas Hemingway here, and I am pumped to share with you all things fasting. And intermittent fasting is literally just the tip of the iceberg. It's just one sort of version of fasting. It's one that's gotten, I think, all the popular press recently, and, and maybe for good reason, because I think of it as maybe an easier approach. You know, I think often when we get this whole concept in our minds, like fasting, we're like, oh my gosh, we got to go without food. And, and for how long? Like, what does that look like? And, you know, I was raised in a religion where we fasted at least once a month, which, which I'm grateful now that I did this because it really, it, it, it really made me appreciate that a couple of things. One, that it really wasn't that hard. You know, I, I didn't start as a super young kid. That, that would be a little silly to, to make kids, you know, fast and stuff. But once I was, you know, a youth and an adult, you know, I was fasting at least once a month. And, and what it taught me, it taught me a couple of things. One, I mean, I felt awesome, <laughs> especially as an adult. I, I think that for some reason, I think fasting just gets better as we age. It's one of those things, right? I mean, uh, you know, we often complain about things going south when we age, but there are some things that just get better. And for me, fasting is one of them. I have enjoyed and appreciated fasting more now in my adult years than, than I ever have. And I've gained more and more benefits, more energy, more vitality, more improved mental focus and clarity. And it's just not, you know, as a kid, and I'm not saying this, I don't think we should make our kids fast, but but I learned about this concept as a kid and I was like, I wasn't fasting because I wasn't required to, but I knew about it and I was like, oh my gosh, I never want to do that. Why would I ever want to go without eating? <laughs> well, what I didn't know is that nowadays, you know, we have this concept of time-restricted eating or time-restricted feeding, which is one of the variations of intermittent fasting. Let's just, let's just debunk this whole kind of mystical concept out there that, you know, we talk about fasting and intermittent fasting. All, all intermittent fasting means is there are periods of time where we're not eating or not consuming calories. And there's periods of time when we are like there's a window of eating and a window of not eating. And it's that simple. It's not complicated. And it, <laughs> I think, I think we all, especially me when I was a kid, you know, I, I heard of this concept of fasting. I just thought, oh my gosh, you're depriving yourself. You can't eat or you can't do anything or whatever. And I just didn't, I didn't really appreciate it because I didn't understand it. But what I didn't know is that I was fasting, at least by intermittent fasting kind of standards and protocol. I was fasting every single day for like 14 hours and I didn't even know it. Let me give you the scenario. So my mom, she is amazing. And as a kid, she was cooking dinner every night and literally it was on the table 5 p.m. My dad came home from work, you know, pretty traditional family. And she had dinner on the table at five. We were all done with school. We were playing outside, playing basketball, baseball, jumping on the trampoline, whatever, skateboarding. And we'd all come in five o'clock, we'd eat our dinner. And if there was one of us that said, oh my gosh, I wasn't into this dinner tonight. Maybe it was uh, <laughs> some kind of meatloaf or who knows what. <laughs> my mom, my mom, I, I bless her heart. She would cook these kind of casserole things, which I didn't love all of them. I'll just be honest. But uh, I knew if I didn't eat, like that was it for me. The kitchen was literally closed by the decree of my mom at whatever it was, 5.30 p.m. or for sure by 6 because we were usually eating at 5. And then it wasn't open again until the next morning until 7.30 or so. Our school didn't start super early. I think it started around 8 or so, maybe even 8.15 or 8.30. It wasn't super early in California where I grew up. And so we did not eat from 5.30 p.m. until 7.30 a.m. the next day. Like that was a 14-hour intermittent fast. And I didn't even know I was doing it because that was just life, right? We didn't have snack food. We didn't have, we, we didn't go to the drive through at night. We didn't go to the convenience store. Like there was no pantry that was open for the taking in the middle of the night. If I got hungry, like nothing, we just did not eat from 5 30 PM until 7 30 AM. So I fasted literally as a kid for 14 hours each and every day. And I didn't even know I was fasting. It was that stinking easy. This is what I call the concept of a circadian or an overnight, a circadian fast. And literally it can be done that easily. So this kind of falls into the variation of intermittent fasting considered time-restricted feeding or time-restricted eating. And, you know, the simplest form of this is, is that exact format, the overnight fast, you know, and I would shoot for, if you've never done this before, just start with 12 hours. 
it's really not that difficult. So in my example, I ate dinner at 5 p.m. Say I was done by six and you know most of us would stay up until at least nine. My goal is always to have about three hours after your last meal before your head hits the pillow because you don't wanna to go to sleep with a full stomach for a couple of reasons. One, it's just not super awesome. It's not super comfortable, right? You're not gonna sleep as well. I guarantee your sleep is gonna be a little bit fragmented because digestion is actually quite an arduous process. It involves tons of energy. Your stomach is gonna be tossing and turning and <coughs> doing, and doing you know, loops and flips and not what you want to be happening when you're trying to sleep. Trust me on this one, guys. So many of us have a bedtime curfew. At least, you know, we set one. Hopefully we do for ourselves. It's great to have a rhythm and routine. You guys know if you've heard my podcast on sleep or you've done my sleep course, routine is really important. And not only should we have a bedtime routine and a bedtime curfew, we should, we should have a food curfew. A food curfew, right? What a concept. So about three hours prior to bed, we should stop the feeding, stop the eating. And that will give us this window where our body can kind of get into its restorative mode where it can rejuvenate itself. And this is where the magic happens. We're gonna get into that in just one second because I love to talk about the benefits of fasting and most of the which we can enjoy each and every day while we sleep. So anyway, time-restricted feeding, that's the simplest version of intermittent fasting. That's kind of this overnight fast, what I call the circadian fast. Shoot for 12 hours if you've never done this before. Just try to eat dinner a little bit earlier, maybe be done by six or at least by seven. Don't go to bed until about 10. And then when you get up, let's say eight hours later, that's what, 6 a.m., just don't eat for a couple of hours, right? You don't have to put something in your mouth when you first wake up. And if you want to put something in your mouth, drink a full glass of water. I, I do that every morning, 16 to 20 ounces of water. Boom, I chug it when I first wake up. Not only does that hydrate me because I haven't had anything to sip on for at least eight hours while I was sleeping, so I hydrate myself, but it gives myself a little bit of a mental boost and clarity. There's this whole Ayurvedic medicine technique that actually starts the day hinging upon really good hydration. I think they shoot for, maybe it's even more, 24 or 32 ounces of water. I forget what it is exactly, but it's a, it's a specific name. I, I've, I've forgotten the Ayurvedic name. I apologize, but it's a water drinking that starts when you first wake up in the morning. So that's perfectly fine. Or you can even drink coffee or tea as long as you're not adding things like sugar, creamers, you know, things that have calories in them, right? You can even do, you know, if you want to get fancy, you could do this kind of fancy variation if you're a coffee drinker, the so-called, you know, bulletproof style of coffee drinking. You don't have to buy bulletproof coffee. If you want to, you can, but, but you know, Dave Asprey and I, I'm not, I'm not uh, getting any kickback from him. I think it's a great concept. Um, but what it is, is basically you add something to your coffee that's not gonna spike your insulin or your blood sugar, which would be something that's not carbohydrate dense, right? You're not gonna add sugar to it. You could add some, for example, coconut oil or MCT oil, and that won't break your cycle of what's called the fat burning or, or ketosis that will happen basically overnight from not eating. We'll get into that a little bit later, but if you need to tide yourself over a little bit when you first wake up, it's fine to drink coffee or tea, just don't add any cream or sugar. If you need to add a little sustenance, if you will, add a tablespoon of MCT oil, right? Or maybe some ghee or something or, or what have you. But, but literally that, because it's fat and not loaded with carbs, that will still keep you in the fat burn state, which most of us wanna be in to kind of lean up a bit. And you know, even me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't probably believe me if I told you, but you know, I could probably trim a, a teeny bit off my waistline. I do have a six pack at you know, nearly 50 years of age or an eight pack, like my good buddy out there who's a power lifter. He's like, dude, that's not a six pack, man. That's an eight pack. And I, I don't really notice. I'm not really checking myself out that way, but uh, it's, it's uh, I could even afford to trim up a bit. And so I love to be in fat burn overnight because I think it's awesome. We all have some, some uh, fat that we wanna burn for energy because not only is it awesome and it feels good to burn fat for energy, but it burns cleaner. We don't get inflammation from it. We don't get achy, like it's just awesome. So to continue the fat burn, you just can't be using carbs, right? So you can have coffee, you can have tea, you can have whatever you're, morning drink is as long as it doesn't have sugar or carbs in it. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So 
So that's the simplest fast. That's just the overnight fast or circadian fast. Try to do 12 hours if you've never done this before. So three hours before uh, bed, you don't eat, and then you sleep for eight hours. You're already at 11 hours. All you gotta wait is one hour after you wake up to put something in your body as far as you know sustenance, if you will. And if you can delay it by a couple more hours, even better, right? You can get to 14 if you just delay it by, what is that, two or three hours, and then 16 if you delay it by a couple more hours. It's, it's really not that hard, but a little bit at a time. What I recommend people have never tried, shoot for about 12 hours in the beginning, and then you can just add maybe a half an hour every week over the course of the next month, and then before you know it, if you started at 12 and you're four weeks in, you're already at 14, right? You've added 30 minutes each week. 14 is a great window for most people. You can really see a ton of benefit. If you wanna get up to 16, awesome. And there's no right or wrong answer here. For some people, they love 14. Some people love 16. I'm right in that neighborhood, 14 to 16. If, if I'm super busy and I'm cranking away on work and, and whatnot, I can do 18, but I don't do 18 each and every day because I, I feel like I'm such a... <laughs> energy, you know, burning dense, you know, that way I just always, you know, love to just burn tons of energy. I'm just so dang active. I don't like to go more than about 16 hours unless I forget, <laughs> you know, I just get in, in the middle of something, I'm doing a show or I'm recording something with somebody else and I have back to back stuff and, you know, maybe I'm just hydrating in between. Sometimes I just forget. I just get so busy because it's such an awesome feeling to be fasting and have your mind clear and your channels open. Your brain is just creative. And anyways, it's, it's something that I, I enjoy so much that I just forget sometimes. But 12-hour overnight fast, that's a time-restricted feeding, is a great place to start. There's also uh, the so-called alternate day fast, right? It's basically kind of like a 24-hour fast every other day. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for starters. That's, you know, if you've never done a 24 hour fast before, it's a little bit challenging. I think at least nowadays, most of us understand that it's totally fine to drink water and to hydrate. Like when I was a kid, that's what I was fearing, I think is the fact that like when I was kind of learning about this concept about fasting, I was hearing about people like, you know, like Moses and, and other, you know, folks in the, in the books of scripture that would go out you know, for long periods of time and not eat or drink. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to ever do that. That's ridiculous. Like I'm going to die, you know? And what I didn't understand is that, you know, drinking <laughs> for hydration is what we want us to, all to do. We want to be able to stay hydrated. You don't want to be faint. And there's people that have gone for, geez, a week or more long fast. They're hydrating, of course, but they're not eating any calories and they rave about the experiences. I've never gone more than a couple of days personally. I don't know, maybe I'm just a wimp, but uh, I, you know, <laughs> I'll do it at some point, but a couple of day fast for me is just fine. I get plenty of benefits. And then for the most part, I'll just do my intermittent fast most days, about five days a week. And then I'll at least do my one 24 hour fast per month. Um, sometimes I do more than that, but uh, I keep it pretty simple. I'm not going a week without eating or anything crazy like that. And I'm not encouraging you guys to do that without some kind of uh, planning and getting used to it, maybe some med medical uh, supervision, etc. But there's this approach called alternate day fasting. Like I said, it's about a 24 hour fast every other day. I think it's a little extreme for most people. There's this uh, there's this 5-2 uh, uh, version of intermittent fasting, which is basically you eat hopefully a healthy diet five days a week and then two days. They could be consecutive or they could be, you know, every third day type of thing. It doesn't really matter. Whatever works for you, you basically have a five to 600, you know, calorie day twice a week. And then the rest of the week you eat whatever your normal is, 1,500 calories, whatever, provided it's hopefully good, <laughs> nutritious, whole foods, not processed foods, right? So that's the 5-2 approach. There's the alternate day approach. There's the uh, the OMAD, some people are talking about, the one meal a day approach, which is kind of like a pretty extreme intermittent fast. It'd be like a 22 hour or 23 hour, you know, intermittent fast. And I just think that's, I think people can really sometimes take it a little bit beyond where you need to and doing those sorts of things once in a while I think is okay. I don't think our bodies were necessarily meant to do 
23 hour fast every single day for our whole life. Like that's probably not the best approach for most of us. It's certainly not for children and babies and things like that. So none of this is applicable right now to kids or babies or anything. This is, we're talking adults here. So please don't <laughs> extrapolate this. And of course, none of this is medical advice, quote unquote. I'm, I'm sharing with you my personal experience. I'm going to share data with you coming up here. Um, but uh, this is not medical advice. So so yeah, there's the um, alternate day fasting. We talked about that, the 5-2 approach, the time-restricted feeding. The most common of that is probably the 16-8. I was mentioning start with like a 12-12 where you just do a 12-hour overnight fast. And then you can work up that window to 14 hours or maybe 16. And then you have eight hours of your feeding window where you can fit in two or three meals, whatever works for you. And, and the cool thing about all of this is that this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. This is you know, independent upon each and every person. We're all individuals, we're all unique. So just because one certain way works for me doesn't mean it's gonna be exactly the same for you. And so before we get into the nuance of it, I wanted to share a little bit about the beauty and the magic. Why I love intermittent fasting or some version of fasting so, so much. Well, first of all, it's, a game changer with respect to our energy, our mental clarity and focus. I mean, <laughs> the brain on steroids, well, the good kind of steroids, the stuff called brain derived neurotrophic factor literally goes through the roof when we fast. There's been TED Talks on this. There's been lots of articles in the New England Journal. There's this whole concept of the metabolic switch that was reported a few years back in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious medical journals. Rafael de Cabo, for example, was one of the authors there. And it's literally a game changer, not only because it's awesome and it's it's sort of in tune with, with the in vogue thing of the time and the days, intermittent fasting, but it talks about metabolically what's happening, how we can actually get into that fat burning state. Because most of us, sadly, stay in a carbohydrate dependent state because I mean, the data shows it. I'm not going to lie, you know, here in the U S at least I can speak to this data. 60% of our diet is not only carbohydrate rich, but highly processed carbohydrate foods, which is crazy. I mean, these are for the most part, what I <laughs> humbly call the food like substances. And I know you guys listen to this are not making up that percentage because you're here and you're pursuing the whole food, real food diet, which is amazing. But we need to share the message because unfortunately the numbers show that here in the US, almost, I think it's like 57 or 58% at the last report, nearly 60% of our calories here in the US comes from a highly processed foods diet, which is insane, right? Not just a little bit processed, highly processed. <laughs> It's crazy. So the reason I love, love, love what happens besides mentally how amazing I feel, the sharpness, the clarity, how much energy. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but you get, you have this window, like when you wake up in the morning, when you haven't eaten, you're hydrating, of course, but you are on fire. Your brain is active. I almost always do a fasted workout of some kind because I just, I feel so energized and enthused. And this may not happen for you on day one, but as you get used to it, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, like this is amazing. And plus the results you get with a fasted workout, so incredible. What I really wanted to talk about is the benefits. Let's just talk hormonally, for example. Like, why does this even happen? How could we possibly have more energy? Well, a couple of things are happening, right? One, your growth hormone levels go up when you fast and that, is all about metabolic activity, your human growth hormone. You know, if you're thinking like, oh crap, I'm getting older, you know, who's out there use the I'm getting older excuse? Like all of us have, right? I, I used it a lot in my 30s, maybe a little bit less in my 40s because I was really paying attention to, to some of these things about metabolism and my diet and, you know, uh, intermittent fasting also as well. But hormone levels get optimized when we fast. I know that sounds a little weird, but it's true because what happens when we fast? Well, the crappy stuff that makes us fat, namely, well, it's not crappy, it's essential, but namely insulin goes down when we fast, right? It's actually insulin. Most of you know this. Insulin makes us fat, which it comes from the carbs. Carbs is what makes us fat. 
fat doesn't necessarily make us fat, but insulin goes up when the carbs go up and that literally tells our body, hey, store that glucose as fat because we only have room for about 4% of those calories in stored glucose or glycogen as it's called. And so when we fast, the insulin goes down, right? Which facilitates the ability in our body to be able to actually burn or metabolize fat because as long as insulin is up, if we're eating carbs, we can basically never get into our fat store. So if you want to lose a little bit across the midsection, wherever you might have some handles or, or little areas you want to get rid of, never going to happen if you, number one, if you don't take a break from carbohydrates, you need to have a window where you're not eating any carbohydrates. And I would suggest that you go beyond this window and maybe reduce the percentage of carbohydrates that you eat because most of us just eat too many carbohydrates, plain and simple. That's what the data shows. And it's not our fault necessarily because we just haven't been taught this, right? The recommended daily allowance, you know, what's put out every year, at least to the USDA, they're telling us we should be eating mostly carbs, which it's, it's crazy. It's not the best advice. And look where it's gotten us, right? We've gone through this whole phase. This is my lifetime I speak of because when I was a kid, this is when this started in the 70s. Like, we need to pursue this quote unquote low fat diet, right? Well, essentially when you lower the macronutrient fat, something else has to go up. And that something else, if you lower fat, well, what happened is the carbohydrates went through the roof. And as the carbohydrates went through the roof, so did our heart disease, our diabetes, our obesity. Like all these things have just skyrocketed in the last 50 years. And a lot of it's due to this macronutrient mayhem that's been going on with with the percentages of carbs and highly processed carbs that we've been eating. So sorry I digress, but when we give our bodies a break, our hormones can get to their best levels, right? Insulin can go down, that decreases our chance of insulin resistance. Human growth hormone goes up, that cranks up our metabolism. We can actually get into a fat burning state the magic, this stuff, you guys, have, you guys have heard of this process called autophagy. Autophagy, you know, in Greek or Latin just means self-eating. And I know it sounds kind of weird, self-eating. Well, what happens when your cells get old and senescent, they call them, and the organelles, the, the parts that make up the cells, the inside parts like the mitochondria and everything else that's important inside, at some point it breaks down when the cells get old and your body needs to recycle or wants to recycle that stuff, break it down into the smallest usable uh, ingredients like the amino acids, for example, then it can use that as building blocks for new cells. So autophagy, this sort of self-eating that happens when you break down the old cells and then you take you know, the breakdown products and use them to build new cells, it's the way that your body does what I like to call cellular housekeeping, right? It's trash day at the Hemingway house. You know, we have six kids. Most of you guys know that family of eight. Like when we have trash day, it's awesome. I love trash day because, you know, take all the stuff out to the curb. You know, you feel like, whew, you had a little flush. You know, all the trash cans in the house are empty. You start anew. Like I can't even imagine what would happen if we skipped. Well, I know it would happen because occasionally, rare, we've forgotten to take the trash out to the curb and like, we just can't make it another week. Like eight, eight people generates, unfortunately, more trash than I'd like to comment about, but, but it gets messy. The, uh, I think it's the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy, maybe it's the first law, help me out, I forget which is first, which is second, but the entropy of the universe is expanding. In other words, entropy is the disorder. So that's going up and that's like my household. The entropy in my household, if just left to, Everyday activities, it's chaotic. My kids are in this Lego phase and it's awesome. I love to see it, but there are Legos everywhere. And I'm gonna have, right after I finish recording, I'm gonna have them kind of pick things up a bit because uh, my wife's coming back from a trip to the mainland uh, where she was um, recording a live show with uh, Rachel Shear. Hopefully you guys have heard of her. She's amazing. If you don't follow her already, Rachel Shear Nutrition. She's awesome. She's super, super spot on with respect to gut health. Uh, Brooke was just on her show this past week and she got to record it live in LA. So super cool. She's coming home today and, uh, and I'm going to have the kids 
do a little bit of uh, not just cellular housekeeping, but a little bit of Hemingway housekeeping and pick up all the stuff because the entropy or the disorder increases when left at bay. And so in our body, if we don't take a break, if we don't fast for some period of time, we never get into this autophagy phase where we do the cellular housekeeping, the cleanup, where the old cells, you know, we take out the trash, so to speak, and we use those, you know, small um, breakdown products to build new cells. It's the way to refresh, revitalize, rejuvenate, you know, to to really just get our bodies in tip-top performance shape. That only can happen basically when we're not eating, because if we're eating, all of that energy gets shunted to the digestive process, which is super energy intense. So we need a break. We need a break. And naturally, this has been designed to happen while we sleep. And then, of course, millennia ago, when we didn't have refrigerators, pantries, drive throughs like we always woke up in the morning and waited a couple hours before we ate because we didn't have food sitting next to our bed. We didn't have a pantry. We didn't have a little a little cubby someplace where we hit our little Hershey's bars or our snacks or whatever that might be. <laughs> we never had that, right? If we did, some animal would have found it in the middle of the night and there would have been, uh, there would have been some drama. But we'd have to get up and go search out our food. So it would take us a couple of hours. So we practice this kind of intermittent fasting for millennia ago. And I even practiced it as a kid, as I explained at the outset, when I didn't even realize it. So the beauty of it, it's during this phase, this overnight, typically while we're sleeping phase or whenever we're not eating, that the magic happens, that our bodies can have this cellular repair, the trash goes out, the housekeeping, you know, this is where the magic happens. And also there's lots of genetic things that happen um, which are related to the longevity um, aspect. There's been lots of data showing that when you practice fasting or some type of caloric restriction, that this is beneficial to not only your immediate health, what you can feel and notice in the then and there right while you're doing it, but also for your longevity. And this has been well studied, especially in mice. You know, the David Sinclairs of the world have been looking at this for decades. And I think he's He's maybe a little bit too extreme for me. I, and I, you know, you check him out. Um, and I think he, I, I don't know if he, he's an OMAD kind of guy, a one meal a day kind of guy or what, but he seems to be sort of approaching that. I find like, it's a little bit extreme for most of us and I'm not, I'm not uh, um, you know, promoting that. I think that we should all find the window that works best for us, but I think we can all do a 12 hour window. Like that should be feasible for basically everyone. In fact, in my work with, I've worked with lots of people over the years, especially diabetics, especially type two diabetics. And when I have encouraged them and they have complied and they've done this, at least a 12 hour working themselves up, usually to about a 14 and often even 16 hour fashion. Now, if you are diabetic out there, please work with your physician, especially if you're on insulin. Like this you, you don't want to just mess with, you know, fasting without adjusting your insulin, right? Because then you can dip into hypoglycemia. We're not going to get into that. That's something you should talk with your practitioner about. But for, for the most common numbers of diabetics out there, they are type 2 diabetics. Hopefully most of them are not on insulin because in my humble opinion, like, I don't even know if I should say this, but it's actually borderline malpractice in my humble opinion to put a type 2 diabetic on insulin because type 2 diabetes by definition is actually insulin resistant. In other words, if you were to measure the insulin level of a type 2 diabetic, that level is already through the roof. And if you are treating it with additional insulin, adding to this extra insulin resistance that's already in existence, like that is the wrong therapy. That's the wrong treatment. Literally, I have seen many people correct their type 2 diabetes, reverse it, and, and be cured of it with basically practicing not only an intermittent fasting style approach, but a low carb diet and a real, yeah, I said it, real, real food diet. Like it's amazing the benefits of such a simple thing. So if you want more on that, um, <laughs> reach out to me individually. Um, I'd be happy to share my experience with that. I do do one-on-one -on -one, uh, private consults. You can acquire my website, thomashemingway.com. 
I can also speak at your event. We can talk more about that. But, but the amazing thing is that this window of not eating called intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding, it has such a tremendous benefit with so many hormones. Insulin is really the tip of the iceberg. And, and for most of us, we want insulin to go down because we eat too many carbs and insulin is up way too often. And every time it's up, it not only limits our ability to burn fat, but it actually puts us at risk for insulin resistance, which is an inflammatory pre, pre-diabetic state that most doctors won't ever discover because they don't check for it, right? You need to do a fasting insulin. Doing a fasting blood sugar, you're not gonna catch diabetes until you're a decade too late. So if you haven't got blood work recently and you're about to, please ask your doctor not only to get the fasting glucose, but get the fasting insulin because you can miss uh, prediabetes so easily with the fasting uh, blood sugar. So anyway, Insulin levels and other hormone levels are greatly improved with this overnight circadian fast. Um, growth hormone levels go up. Testosterone often goes up. Dudes out there, if you're having low T, like your issue may be insulin resistance. And as you improve that with something so simple like intermittent fasting, you'd be surprised how your testosterone will come right back up. It's amazing. I've seen it happen dozens and dozens of times. So besides these awesome hormonal things like most of us are kind of excited about, you know, maybe losing a couple of pounds for summer, you know, and this could easily be done through this little tool called intermittent fasting. There's actually this new um, kind of version. Well, it's not really new, but it's being shared uh, like a new program. It's a three day. Um, basically what it is, is, is a three day calorically restricted, uh, nutritionally supported fast. And we're going to talk all about nutritionally supported fasting in my upcoming uh, live with my Thrive community. This is something that you really wanted to hear about. So, uh, you know, I, I like to talk about what you guys want to hear about. So if you want to get in on the conversation this weekend, Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern, just get into the Thrive community before then and you'll have access to this, this live call, which is going to be awesome. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's getting dry here. So so what is awesome is that, yes, intermittent fasting, I've seen great benefits with respect to not only improving insulin parameters, but also trimming up your waistline. And there's actually a 2014 uh, study I wanted to share with you um, that showed that intermittent fasting can help with weight loss of up to 8% over three weeks. And this, you know, if you look at a lot of dieting studies and stuff, that's actually quite a bit of weight loss for just three weeks. Um, this specific protocol that a lot of peeps are, are considering doing right now, this three-day basically caloric restriction where you do take nutritionally supportive uh, ingredients, uh, some supplements and some other things like bone broth and things like that. It's about a five to 600 calorie a day um, for three days in a row. And this is very similar to one of the techniques of intermittent fasting called the 5-2 approach, right? We talked about that at the outset where two days a week, you keep your calories limited to somewhere between five and 600 and hopefully they're nutritious calories. That's what I love about this um, three day thing is the calories are provided for you. They keep it super simple and they are nutritional things, right? It's like hydration, electrolytes, bone broth, you know, things that are actually good for you, right? None of the bad stuff. I think, I think in health sometimes <laughs> we avoid the simplest things, right? One of the easiest ways to get healthy is just don't partake of the bad stuff, right? <laughs> don't eat the bad stuff, number one, and then fill your body full of good stuff. And one of the cool things about this three-day thing is that you're not putting any of the bad stuff in. <laughs> so I think that's one of the reasons it works so well. Plus the caloric restriction is helpful. It, it has some boosting, you know, metabolic um, stuff in there as far as gut health stuff. And so it, it has a little bit of an additional boost. There's another study I want to share with you that um, looked at intermittent fasting as well. And it showed not only weight loss, but in um, a decrease in what's called visceral, visceral adiposity. So visceral fat is kind of that unwanted kind of belly fat. You know, this is like, I know he's probably not listening and, and I'm not going to say his name, but a, a relative of mine, <coughs> my kids always come up to him and give him a big hug and they're like, dad, how come so-and-so has such a, a tight, a tight belly, you know, and he's got skinny legs and skinny arms and He's got this, it's called visceral fat. It's the proverbial, um, in medicine, we call it the, uh, <laughs> the, 
the apron, right? It's, um, it's the Latin word for apron, but it's this visceral uh, fat, the panis there that, uh, that he carries. And, you know, his arms are thin, his legs are thin. And they're like, what's up with that? How come, you know, so-and-so has that? I'm like, well, it's, I mean, if you asked him what he ate, he'll tell you. And he's not bashful about it. And it's just, you know, he eats too much fast food. <laughs> and those calories end up as visceral fat. And so not awesome, but this is one way that you can get, get rid of visceral fat, this intermittent fasting approach. And then of course, when you are eating, eating healthy, high quality, real food, it's incredible. It's incredible. In fact, um, there was a 2020 randomized control trial that looked at people who were doing the 16-8 method, which is kind of what I alluded to. I do most days, 14 to 16 hours of fast and an eight hour eating window. It was, uh, uh, showing that the people that did this specific protocol actually lost much more of this visceral fat than the folks who had the same number of calories as a, what's called an ad lib. Ad lib just means you just eat it whenever you don't have any restriction. And, and they, the original studies looking at this were done in mice. And I think the, uh, I want to say um, it was initially done out of the Salk Institute. That's my recollection. And um, this is Dr. Panda, Panda Panda, Sachin Panda Panda, out of the Salk Institute in San Diego. They did the initial studies, which so interesting. They basically took identical, genetically identical mice, and they fed them the exact same thing. Like legit, the same thing. Same calories, same amount, but one group, they only allowed them to eat over an eight hour window and then 16 hours, they weren't eating anything. So this was a mandatory 16, eight, right? They fasted for 16 hours and they only ate during eight hours. The other group, genetically identical mice, got the same food, the same amount, the same calories, all of that, but they could eat it whenever they wanted. So the only thing that was different was the window that they were eating. And this is fascinating because they got the same food, the same calories, and guess what happened? Well, Think you know where I'm going with this? The the ones that did the 16-8 that had an eight-hour feeding window and 16 hours where they were not feeding were much healthier and much slimmer, and they had the same stinking amount of overall calories. Like you just can't make this stuff up. I mean, it it matters that much the timing of our food. Like the 16-8, there's actually been some science, believe it or not. <laughs> so super interesting. This was research from Sachin Panda Panda, who comes out of the Salk Institute uh, in La Jolla in San Diego. And it's, it's amazing. Uh, we talk about its uh, role, the fasting and decreasing diabetes, insulin resistance, and so on. So I don't want to belabor that, but there's lots of data on that, actually. Lots of data with respect to that. One of my favorite things about intermittent fasting, besides this rejuvenative, sort of regenerative <clears throat> phase at night when we're not eating, you know, the restorative phase is that also you have decreased oxidative stress. In other words, inflammation in your body goes way down when you're fasting. I don't know about you guys, but if I eat something kind of crappy, like say I'm out at a potluck or a birthday party and I have a maybe a cheat meal because it's a once in a rare, rare time. I'm out with kids or family celebrating a birthday or something like literally either within hours or the next day. Like I feel it. My joints get achy. I get inflamed. And it's like, oh my gosh, like now I know I, I, I don't eat like that very often because I don't feel good. It's not awesome. Right. And so one of the things that fasting can do is it actually decreases inflammation. It decreases oxidative stress. It decreases these so-called uh, free radicals. There's lots of studies that show this. It actually is one of the quickest ways to fight inflammation. Like if you have some kind of inflammatory condition going on, bad arthritis, bad whatever it is, irritable bowel, sort of colitis, Crohn's disease. I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but literally doing a fast can really get this inflammation to drop. It's one of the best quick ways to decrease inflammation. It's so beneficial. In fact, um, it's such a beneficial therapy that they are even doing this in cancer patients. It's, I know it sounds crazy, but in general, right? We want, we want cancer patients to maintain their weight and everything, but they found that this technique of intermittent fasting helps their cancer treatment go so much better. Like their response to 
the different therapeutics that are available, whether it be um, chemotherapy or like in my mom's condition, um, we're trying to treat her with a non-chemotherapeutic that's more of a hormonal, kind of a bioidentical, you know, body hormone type of approach where <clears throat> before she gets treatment, you know, she'll get a treatment, but she'll try to have a window of not eating before it. It makes the treatment work better. So they're even incorporating the fasting into treatment of cancer, which makes sense, right? Because we, I think most of us know this by now, what makes cancer cells, uh, cells thrive? Well, primarily it's glucose. And if we're not providing them a whole bunch of glucose because we're not eating, right? Or we're not eating carbs when we are eating, we're doing more of a keto style diet. Actually, the cancer usually subsides to some degree. So this kind of technique, not only the ketogenic diet in cancer, but also intermittent fasting and cancer and cancer treatment is actually been very positive in recent studies. So if that's something that you or your family might be um, suffering from, as, as I am in my family, we're, we're having, um, you know, ongoing struggle with cancer. This is one of the potential therapies is incorporating a type of intermittent fasting. So something to, <coughs> something to look into. Um, heart disease gets benefited, of course, like almost everything does with intermittent fasting because of the decreased uh, inflammation. Also, just the cholesterol panels um, improve significantly with fasting. But my favorite is just the overall cellular repair, right? The autophagy that we talked about a little while ago, because what happens here is twofold. You're getting rid of all the toxins that build up over the course of the day. You know, your so-called taking out the trash, if you will. You're getting rid of all this garbage that piles up because if we never take out the trash, like, oh my gosh, cellular havoc, right? <laughs> the trash causes the inflammation, right? There's this whole debate, right? With like, let's just take Alzheimer's dementia, right? They see these deposits of the amyloid uh, plaques in the brain. They're like, well, what's, what's causing Alzheimer's? Is it the amyloid or is it something else? And now I think we're finally coming to the realization that maybe that amyloid was put down to try to combat what was already happening, which was inflammation, because they've actually come out with drugs that block amyloid, and guess what? The Alzheimer's wasn't getting any better. It's like, well, the chicken or the egg, well, they kind of messed up. It wasn't, it wasn't the egg, right? It was, <laughs> the amyloid was there, but it wasn't what was causing the problem, and so those drugs didn't even work, and what's probably causing the issue is the root of all disease, what I talked about you know, a couple of years ago in a podcast and what I will continue to talk about because it is literally the root of every ailment that we suffer from and that is inflammation. Inflammation. <coughs> Excuse me. I got to get some more water. I'm dry here. But inflammation is at the root of all disease, including heart disease, including Parkinson's, including Alzheimer's. It is the inflammation. And the cool thing is when you allow your body to have this period of autophagy, the cleanup, the repair, the rejuvenation, the restorative phase. You get rid of all these you know, toxins and things that build up. You flush the system. We know in the brain this happens at night. While we sleep, we get to flush out all the crap that builds up, right? Clean the cleanup, the, the glial cells. You guys have heard of the so-called glymphatic system. It's kind of like the lymphatic system of the body. This was discovered only about 10 years ago in the brain. It's really amazing stuff, um, how it basically rejuvenates, refreshes, cleans, you know, the cellular housekeeping happens at night while we sleep and while we're not eating. So this whole pathway will help to not only prevent Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and all these neurodegenerative and many other diseases like heart disease, it can help prevent them, but it can also help to even reverse them as we decrease inflammation these conditions can even get better. It's just, it's incredible. And so we, we're talking about the brain right now. Heck, I'm just going to throw in my favorite hormone with respect to the brain. Brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. That's sort of the steroid for the brain, if you will. <laughs> it's just what gets your brain to actually grow, rejuvenate, establish new memories, like even at my age, guys, and yours too, whether it be 50, 60, 70, 80, like you literally can lay down new brain tissue through this pathway. The brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, 
that you can summon when you fast. It's, it's so cool. It actually has been shown to protect, you know, against cognitive decline, protect against brain damage, protect against Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And it's, it's just incredible. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I can't say enough about it. And this primarily goes up with fasting. Yeah, fasting and exercise. That's why you get this boost, right? Mental clarity. You get the boost when you're fasting. And if you do both fasting and exercise, which I do almost every morning, like my brain is rocking and rolling. That's my favorite time of the day. Favorite time of the day. So last but not least, it's going to help me to live until I'm 120. That's my goal. Minimum, I'm going to be surfing until I'm 100. You guys might be getting tired of me talking about this, but this concept of intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding or just some version of caloric restriction, which is also going to be in this three-day uh, reset program that a lot of you folks may be doing, that's what is the beauty of it. This is a version of intermittent fasting. It's kind of like the 5-2 approach, except for you're doing a three-day uh, low caloric phase and then hopefully followed by an amazing, well-sourced, real foods diet. Because don't get into the place where you're like, oh my gosh, I did this three-day metabolic reset thing. I did a caloric restriction for three days in a row. And now I'm just going to celebrate and eat whatever the heck I want. Like you're just defeating the purpose. The, the point of that is to help reset, jumpstart, kind of refresh, rejuvenate, give your body a chance to kind of get the nutrients in that you really, really need, avoid all the bad stuff. And then as you roll into the rest of the month, the other 27, 28 days, to feed your body all the good stuff, real, natural, whole foods, the supplements that you need and things like that. But it's a, a chance to kind of shake things up a little bit. You don't, you don't go out and celebrate and have a pizza or a bowl of ice cream when you're done with that, right? That's, that's the wrong thing to do. You have to segue into the rest of your healthy life. So my favorite benefit, <clears throat> sorry for the digression, but is in lifespan, not only lifespan, but health span. When you do intermittent fasting, this beautiful thing called autophagy not only helps you in the moment, but it's been shown to help lifespan. In fact, when they've studied it in mice, it's one of the only things that has really been able to significantly prolong their lifespan and their health span. So lifespan is just how many calendar years you live, right? Health span is how many calendar years you live, vibrant, active, vital, and being able to do stuff, right? Like who wants to just be alive but not able to do stuff like that's that's where your lifespan and your health span are not aligned for me i literally want to go out the day that my abilities tank like i want to live to my fullest and hopefully that's till well beyond 100 and then you know maybe i'll just uh, who knows i'll drop into a big wave at jaws and that'll be the end at 120 whatever that is but uh but I think we want our lifespan and our health span to be aligned so that we can do the stuff that we love to do. We can be around both mentally and able to appreciate those around us to share and be able to have all of our wits about us. And the way that we can do that, one of the ways is just practicing some version of fasting, whether it be one of these intermittent fasting techniques that we've talked about. But this has been shown over and over again to extend lifespan and health span in basically all the animals that they've studied. And they started it, you know, way back when studying Drosophila, right? That's kind of the famous studied insect, right? It's a fruit fly. And then they studied it in mice. And now we're looking at it in humans. And guess what? It's all uh, consistent that the data is showing that this intermittent fasting and, and fasting in general is super, super beneficial to not only real-time health and wellness, but long-time and for the ages, longevity. So not only can you live a longer life, which is cool, but a much healthier life. So that's, that's really the bottom line. I just, I want you guys to kind of, you know, just be thinking about that for a moment. Like what could you do with maybe an additional 10 years of health? Like forget about just the lifespan part, but of health, of wellness, of the ability of your mind and body to be sharp, for you to be able to do the things that you love with your family, with your friends, those you care about, those you want to spend time with. And one of the tools, guys, is this. It's the timing of your foods, right? 
first and foremost, it's always the choices we make, what lands at the tip of our fork, right? So important, the quality, the source of our food is everything, but then almost equally important is the timing. And if we allow our bodies to have that break where they can do this process, that's the magic that I talk about, the autophagy, it's gonna be a game changer. The cool thing is you will notice it immediately, whether you're doing this three-day challenge coming up or not, that's pretty dang immediate. People notice the effects, but if you just do an intermittent fast each and every night for 12 hours, maybe 13 or 14, I guarantee you, you will see tremendous benefit. But remember, your body likes to mix things up as well. Like don't do an 18-hour fast every single day and never take a break from it. Then your body starts to go, hey, I'm gonna get smart. This guy's trying to trick me. He's putting me through caloric deprivation or um, reduced calories too many days. So I'm gonna hold on to those calories even stronger. It, it's called metabolic adaptation. So don't get into the trap where you do it every single day, 24 seven, you never take a break from it. I personally do about five days a week and I take a break on the weekends. I still eat nutritionally dense, high quality foods, but it's good to mix it up. Your body loves variety, just like each one of us love variety. And so mix it up with your routines a little bit, you know, stay in the healthy pattern, but mix things up, eat new foods. Every week I recommend you, you try something new from the farmer's market or the grocery store, some kind of new fruit, vegetable, whatever. You gotta mix it up. Variety is the spice of life. So until next time, Dr. Thomas Hemingway here signing off. Love you guys. Can't wait to catch you on the next one. A big aloha. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you.